Welcome everyone. Today is the How to Join a Community Garden webinar. My name is Serena Lewin. I am one of the workshops and education coordinators at Green Thumb, the division of the NYC Parks Department that works with community gardens across the city. Thank you so much for being here today. Welcome back if you joined us yesterday for our opening ceremony or welcome to the 38th annual Green Thumb Grow Together Conference if this is your first session of the week. For today's webinar, our moderator is gonna be Erin White, who is the Green Thumb Queens Bushwick Outreach Coordinator, which has a portfolio that includes 15 community boards, 59 community garden groups from Astoria to the Rockaways. Erin began their career at NYC Parks in 2013 as an urban park ranger stationed in Queens and Brooklyn, and has run parks programming ranging from medicinal plants, wilderness survival training, and online workshops on a variety of topics. Erin is a naturalist, urban grower, and outdoor educator who specializes in sustainable agriculture and gourmet mushroom cultivation. So I'm gonna pass the mic to Erin and they're gonna take us through today's session. Thanks, Erin. Thanks everyone for being here. All right, thanks for that welcome, Serena, and welcome everybody. So I'm just looking in the chat I see folks from Brooklyn, I see folks from Queens, Manhattan. We got any other boroughs here? We got anyone outside of New York? Uh, I see some of my gardeners in my portfolio. Welcome y'all. So um, happy to be here and uh, excited to get started with our presentation here. So I'm just going to pull up my presentation and we'll get started. And so, like Serena mentioned, um, I'm going to start off with a presentation a little bit about the history of Green Thumb. And so, you know, if you have any questions, um, you can put them in the chat. No, if those don't get answered, we can um, also answer them in the Slack if you want to go to the Slack afterwards. So, just pulling up the screen. Okay. Okay, everybody. All right, so welcome to the How to Join a Green Thumb Community Garden webinar. So like I was introduced, my name's Erin, and I am an outreach coordinator who works for Green Thumb in Brooklyn and Queens. And so today during this panel, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of community gardens in New York City, uh, the history of Green Thumb, and we're going to speak with some panelists who are actual gardeners and uh, learn a little bit about their gardens and how you become, can become a member of a community garden in the Green Thumb Network. So let's begin. So first we're gonna talk a little bit about the history of community gardens in New York City. And I'm gonna show you a few photos that I think are great examples of a lot of the stories around how these community gardens got started. So this is uh, the story of TLC Sculpture Garden. So you can see in the 1940s here that there's a photo from the 1940s and it's a few houses, some trees, looking very beautiful. This was a prosperous time for New York City, including the outer boroughs, not just Manhattan. And in the 70s, the city experienced a big fiscal crisis. Some people refer to it things like the bad old days is a common phrase that people throw around about those times. And during this crisis, a lot of neighborhoods um, were struggling. Uh, they weren't getting a lot of the support that they needed. And there was a lot of disinvestment. And so they experienced um, just a lot of poverty and a decline in the quality of life in the neighborhoods. And that's exemplified in this photo from the 1980s. So this is the exact same lot that we're looking at. And you can see this dramatic difference in just 40 years. It goes from this row of houses to uh, just basically an empty lot. And this is kind of the symbol of that time was a lot of empty, derelict lots. You can see there's a bit of fencing, maybe a little bit of like, uh, maybe some barbed wire on the fence. So obviously it went from a, a, a community space, a home to something that really wasn't serving the community. And so, you know, this was being repeated in a lot of neighborhoods in the city. And after a while, people in those neighborhoods, in those communities decided that they needed to do something, that they needed to support each other, support their neighbors, support their families, their friends. And this is how the community gardening movement got started. And so people decided to start, take over these lots and start gardens for a lot of different reasons. Some of them just wanted somewhere safe in their neighborhoods to be outside. 
Some of them were artists and they wanted to uh, focus on beautification because you can see this lot isn't, it's got some trees, but you know, it's not really a, as beautiful as seeing these like old houses. And some other people wanted to grow food for their neighbors. Um, you know, when you're experiencing uh, poverty, sometimes you can have food insecurity. And so they wanted to make sure that their neighbors could eat. And so through these community efforts, gardens like this, were, or lots like this were transformed into something like we have today. So this is TLC Sculpture Garden. As it looks today, you can see it's very beautiful, very well maintained. You can see that there's a lot of love here. And so I'm going to give you another example. So here is the concerned residents of Barbie Street. And both these gardens and areas are in Brooklyn. And so you can see in the 1940s, we have this like kind of big house and, you know, looks like a regular neighborhood. And by the 1980s, you can see that it is a lot full of trash. It's got a lot of dumping. It's got some plants, but you know, clearly they're weeds and not very intentionally planted. And so, like I said, through a community effort, through the people in these neighborhoods deciding to take action, this is what the concerned residents of Barbie Street Garden looks like today. So you can see that it's got some beautiful trees, some really nice structures. There's a <laughs> prominent trash bag, so there's no trash on in the area. It's all where it's supposed to be. Um, and so the one thing that's missing from these photos are people. Like I said, this was a community effort. Um, you know, these are, we're seeing an image of the spaces, but what you have to understand is that there are people who actually made these spaces what they are today. So what I'm gonna do is show a video from New Visions Garden. Um, and we're going to hear from the founder of the garden, Eliza Butler, a little bit about why she started the garden and like what that effort took. So I'm going to play the video. And if you, for any reasons, are having trouble like hearing or seeing the video, I'll give you a little summary afterwards. And the founder, Eliza Butler, is here to tell us about the garden and why she founded it. Hello, Miss Butler. How are you? <laughs> Thanks for having us here in this beautiful garden. Can't wait to hear the story. This is what the garden used to look like. Okay, let's just um, orient people. You can you can see that this is the exact same view. The elevated train over Livonia Avenue with the number three uh, passing above us. So you might not be able to hear us very well. Um, is is clearly in this photo, but instead of the lush green scenery, we've got a pile of tires and garbage. How did you see the potential in that for what this can become? Of course, I have a house on the block, and there's kids on the block, and we must feel safe if we're going to live on the block. And we decided, the, I say about 15 of us decided that we had to clean this lot. And we did, and you can look and see what it came to be. We really, we really worked very hard to make this garden look the way it was. Okay, and so um, in this video, uh, Eliza Butler was showing that this lot in this beautiful garden uh, back in the day, this lot used to be uh, literally a pile of tires, something that was serving no purpose to the community. And so her and 15 of her neighbors, it didn't take a huge force, were able to convert that abandoned lot into this beautiful lush garden and I, I love the impeccable timing of the train <laughs> going by in the video but yeah so you can see that the transformative power of community members working together and that's how we got a lot of the community gardens we have today and honestly the even the new community gardens that we're getting today are formed in the same way I mean they're you know it's the people who put the word community in community gardens and so let's also talk a little bit about Green Thumb. So what is Green Thumb? So like I said, the community gardening movement was started in the community. That's why it's called community gardening. And um, after this movement started to pick up, the city realized that we had to provide support to these garden members. And so in 1978, the city created Operation Green Thumb. And that was the initial division that helped support gardeners. And in 1995, uh, Operation Green Thumb joined the Parks Department and just became Green Thumb. And so currently we're the nation's largest gardening program and we support over 550 community gardens. And those gardens are populated by about 20,000 volunteer gardeners throughout the city. So you can see all those little dots. Those are all the clusters of gardens that we have throughout the city. You can see it's in all five boroughs. 
And, um, you know, you can see a lot of the neighborhoods, some of the neighborhoods or, or areas are a little more clustered than others in central Brooklyn, South Bronx, Lower East Side, and you got some in um, the Harlem area. And that kind of corresponds to, you know, a lot of the communities that were experiencing the brunt of this fiscal crisis I mentioned earlier, particularly in low income and community of, uh, communities of color. So that's how you uh, got this concentration of community gardens. And so uh, most gardens are under New York Park's jurisdiction, but there's about 181 other gardens that are under other government agencies or land trusts and some agencies like MTA, for instance. And the main mission of Green Thumb is to help New Yorkers strengthen their neighborhoods by building and caring for community gardens. And so how do we do that? Uh, and this is a photo from uh, the Green Thumb Grow Together Conference from 2019. And uh, this is pretty much all of the Green Thumb staff. Um, you know, it's a small but mighty force. And so we support gardeners through our three separate divisions. It's uh, community engagement, planning and programs, and operations. And I'll talk a little bit about each division. So community engagement, uh, that's actually the division that I belong to, and I'm an outreach coordinator. And so outreach coordinators basically liaison with gardens and figure out their needs, if they're having any challenges, and we try to support them through that. And that can be something as simple as getting uh, supplies delivered like soil, mulch, uh, wood. Uh, we also facilitate garden meetings. You can see in this photo, that's exactly what's happening is a garden meeting is being facilitated by one of our outreach coordinators. Um, and we also encourage group development. If a group has trouble um, getting new members or they want to put on an event, we can help them with that. The other division is planning and programs. So this is the team that works on special projects and major events. They do workshops and trainings. Um, they do garden, garden visioning, which is happening in this photo right now. You can see that these gardeners are uh, planning something for the garden. They can be planning where to put in new beds, where to do a whole redesign of the garden. Um, if someone's trying to start a new garden in an empty lot, that's who you would be talking to is planning and programs. And they also help to get arts in the garden. And uh, I'd say most importantly right now, they help to put on special events like the Harvest Fair and uh, the Grow Together Conference. So shout out to Planning and Programs for uh, helping put this conference together. And finally, we have Green Thumb Operations. So they help to take care of the physical space of the garden. So if the outreach coordinator, you know, is ordering soil and mulch, uh, then GTO or Green Thumb Operations are the people who are actually delivering those to the garden. Um, you know, if Planning and Programs has a visioning session and a garden decides that they want to redo how their beds are laid out, it's GTO that'll help come in potentially uh, help build those beds. Uh, so yeah, they do install and garden infrastructure like sheds and other things and property management. And so that's a little bit about Green Thumb, but let's get back to the heart of community gardens. And those are the gardeners. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about how community gardens are run by the gardeners. So like I said, Green Thumb helps to support these gardens, but we don't run them. So gardens govern themselves. I talked a little bit about the history of community gardens and how they were started by the community. And so we want to maintain that autonomy for the gardens and that we allow garden groups to create their own rules and decide what kind of garden they want to have. So you can see here uh, that little selection ballot. So, you know, the gardeners have decided certain garden positions that they're going to have in the garden and they're having an election to see who will fill those roles. And so, you know, a garden's purpose and design is a group's decision. So the group can decide what kind of garden they want to have and how that garden is run. And so gardens come in many different shapes and sizes. No two green thumb gardens is like. So some of the examples of gardens are food production. So people want to grow food. You can see there's some lovely vegetable plants there, botanical and horticultural um, for people who just love the joy of gardening. There's social and cultural preservation for folks who want to, um, you know, maintain if there's a particular culture in their neighborhood, in their community, and they want to have events that uh, help to support that. And children's gardens, for gardens that want to focus on providing these gardening and outdoor opportunities to youth. And to be honest, you know, a lot of gardens do a little bit of all of those things. Some gardens will have, you know, a children's program and also grow vegetables and also have events that involve music or art. And um, one important thing I'll note is that when you're looking for a uh, green thumb garden, just think about what you want to be doing in the garden. So the garden closest to you might not be, you know, the garden you want to get involved with if you want to grow uh, vegetables and it's more of a sitting garden that doesn't have any garden beds. So just keep that in mind that 
you know, not every garden um, is built in the same way or has the same purpose. Okay, so now we're going to meet our panelists for our panel, and um, we're going to have them introduce themselves. But first, I'll just um, say who they are and what gardens they come from. So first, we have Nancy ortiz Sarun, who comes from La Fica del Sur in the South Bronx. And we have Shauna Gladden from Dunton Community Garden out in Queens. And we have Ora Goodwin um, from Success Garden out in Brooklyn. And so um, I'm going to, so first we have Ora Goodwin from Success Garden in Brooklyn. And so Ora, I'm just gonna let you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your garden. Hi, um, good morning. My name is Ora Goodwin. Um, about success, success is, uh, I don't know, it's a beautiful place. Um, it's opening to the community. We do a lot of events and give backs there. Our coordinator is Bill. And we just, we just work it the best way we can. Um, you know. <laughs> okay, thanks for that. Okay, and we're going to move on to our next panelist. Oh, and we have some photos here of, of, um, of the garden too, of Ora's garden. And you can see that they, you know, they have multiple things they're doing here. Here's a one event that has some music looks like, and then they also are growing plants. Okay, and so now we have uh, Nancy from La Finca del Sur. Hi, Nancy. You got to meet. Hello, I've, I've got it, yeah. Hi. Um... Good morning and peace and health to everybody. And I feel very blessed to be part of this event and this panel. Um, La Finca del Sur is a 13 year old um, urban farm, actually. We have the distinction of being the Bronx's first um, woman founded urban farm. And, ooh, okay, one moment. <laughs> Just having a little bit of trouble with my video. Uh, Okay. All right, having a little bit of trouble with my video, but um, yeah, we're the first uh, woman founded um, uh, urban farm. And um, we, you know, uh, feel very uh, proud of that fact um, in that we are a, a place of healing, a place of uh, growing, of learning primarily, of, of having a space for community and their voices. So in addition to um, growing food, we also, you know, have cultural events. We have uh, lots of community meetings. We have um, workshops. We've been the site of training by um, uh, Farm School, um, Green Thumb, Bronx Green Up, you know, several, several community partners. Um, you know, my role there is um, as a co core farmer uh, coordinator, um, I love to bring together people and um, events and all sorts of um, programming that uh, supports our growth. Um, we were originally planned through a series of youth-led community-based meetings by More Gardens and For a Better Bronx many years ago. Um, and, you know, the purpose was to gather neighborhood input as to what was needed to manage a better food and health system. And then our groups of growers, activists, artists, teachers, healers and supporters came together. We broke ground and uh, opened to our community in May of 2009. The central element of membership at La Finca is coalition, right? We're interdependent in stewarding this space and to be a central gathering point for all ages, cultures, experiences, wisdoms, and support. Um, I often personally reference the idea that farming is not a virtual activity. And even though technology supports our learning um, and networks, everything depends on connection to each other and the land. Our membership is based on collective decision-making and committees for diverse operations and a representative farm council. And finally, I'll just say that um, my reason for joining and helping to start La Finca del Sur is based on the memory of my mother, Marta Cruz, who bought us a home, who ran a business and independently raised and educated four children about uh, 15 blocks away from La Finca. And she taught me the resilience that La Finca represented and that I'm really proud to be a part of today. All right, thanks for sharing that. And so next we have Shauna Gladden. 
of Dunton Community Garden. Hi, Shauna. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Shauna Gladden. I'm the current president of uh, Dutton Community Garden. Uh, the garden was started uh, in the in, you know, mid to late 80s, um, but it was utilized by the Civic Association more as a lot that they took back um, from the community that was growing. There was a lot of gangs and a lot of drugs being dealt around in the corner. So it became a space that they allowed us to be kids in. Um, they threw carnivals for us. They did uh, Halloween parties. They made sure that we had a safe place to, to play. Um, so once it became a garden, it also became a space for learning. Um, as you can see in the picture there, there's activities that has been done in the gazebo, whether it's a movie night or uh, uh, music festivals in the summertime. Um, we have a lot of programs we used to run during the summer for kids um, and of course uh, some adult stuff during the weekends um, basically to make the space uh, more community uh, for whatever the community needed. Um, so we look forward to getting back to some of that as well. Okay, awesome. Let's start by going around to all of our panelists and seeing why did you join your garden in the first place? What brought you to that part of your community? Or why were you inspired to start a garden in your community if it didn't exist before? Nancy, would you like to go first? Um, oh, sure. Okay. Yeah, I was um, very inspired and excited by the idea of a, you know, the first urban farm in the Bronx being founded by um, Black and Latina women and our allies. Um, you know, it was a way of um, centering the focus and decision making and the ability to gather community by people from that community and, um, you know, to create a better food system. Um, at, I'm thinking back to 2009 and what was available in terms of food. There was no fresh, you know, organically raised local food to speak of, you know, in Port Morris and Mar Haven. There were, you know, community gardens that had been founded earlier. Um, and, you know, that really taught us a lot about getting off the ground and in, you know, being able to network with them, you know, we, I think that we really started to make an impact that is growing until today um, in the South Bronx. Um, you know, so it was the part of that, as, again, I will mention my mother, um, my mother's inspiration in terms of making, you know, better where you are standing right now and um, I remember our co-founder, Karen Washington, she prophetically stating the importance um, of our women of color um, centered founding. Um, you know, our residents and partners were making, creating this legacy about the South Bronx doing it for ourselves. Um, it has become, and as a, an educator as well, as a, an abuela, as a person who is very um, community and educationally oriented, you know, I the the opportunity to be part of this was was one of the greatest honors of my life and uh you know i've learned so much along the way i've met so many people that i never would have met you know prior you know unless i had you know become part of la finca and it just felt right you know our community was ready for it and you know i was happy to be able to be a part of it that's wonderful thank you for sharing that or I would you like to share next what inspired you to join your garden or to start it? Yes. Um, so I joined Success Garden 16 years ago. It was already a garden. Um, it was founded by Salima Davis. Um, when I got there, I actually wasn't a gardener. I didn't sit to garden or anything. I sat on the event committee. And um, what I noticed is that a lot of the homeowners over there got together and created a space where they wanted to grow food. Um, Success Garden is a large garden, so you're able to have an event space and have a garden area also. But what I also realized is that the members that created that garden were older and they needed help. So um, 
Salima came to me and asked me, do I mind helping them? And when I got back there, uh, they actually kicked me out. They told me I wasn't a real gardener, and so I grew something. Um, so my first thing I grew was eggplants. And then after that, I saw that um, they were just there, just, you know, they was doing it for therapy. They just wanted to grow. Um, but it was a bigger potential, and they needed cleaning. So we did our first rebirth, um, and we got it cleaned out. And then they say, hey, we can do something with this space. And we created more beds. And, you know, it's the space where it was when I got there is not where it's at today. And that's a blessing. Thank you, Aura. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, everybody. I'm back on. Had a little technical difficulties. Apologies for that. No worries, Erin. Everyone is going around and sharing what inspired them to join their garden. Um, okay. We have one panelist left. We want to finish off this question and maybe jump back into to where you left off. Okay, sure. Um, who was the last panelist who had to answer that question? That would be me. Okay, um, answer yeah. away. So, uh, I, like I said, when we were younger, the space existed, but it wasn't quite a garden as of yet. Um, I went away to school and raised a family, and I came back from my mother's retirement in 2009, uh, 2009 I'm sorry, and it actually happened to be on a weekend that they had a jazz night in the garden, and it had been so long since I have seen the space and what it had became, and um, kind of similar to Aura, I looked around and I saw that everyone that was doing the programming and everything were a lot older. And I knew that someone had to be there to pick it up as they um, fell off and they were retired, but they, you know, were still working, doing community work. And that's just as a lot of work as a regular job. So I decided when I moved back to join a garden to be that next generation to pay it back for what what it had given me in the first place. Okay, yeah, that's really important, just the intergenerational nature of these spaces. It's a community and, you know, community meets all ages of folks to be involved. So, you know, I think any garden that's a strong garden just has like a wide range of um, ages involved and families and singles and that sort of thing. Um, so uh, another question I wanted to ask, so we talked a little bit about how people would join your garden, um, but I uh, wasn't sure if I missed this, but uh, did we talk about how your membership protocols came to be, like how you decided about those, how to um, let people into the garden and membership? Um, I'll go with you first, Nancy. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, okay. I'm actually, I'm actually already on audio. Okay, so, um, you know, in the early years of the garden, um, because we're not like a backyard space, like many community gardens, especially in the Bronx, are, you know, nestled in neighborhoods, they've got buildings surrounding them, and, you know, membership is kind of um, already in place. For La Finca, we're on um, almost two and a half acres in an, uh, an in industrial uh, sort of strip. In Port Morris, that's becoming, um, it's changing is all I can say. You know, there are new buildings coming up and whatever. But at that time, you know, everyone that came to La Finca traveled um, in some way. And we all, you know, we all did the work. As with any community garden, you know, things just flowed organically. Um, you know, later on, uh, be, being a green thumb garden, um, we were able to get support in terms of putting together um, bylaws, in terms of thinking about our protocols, the community that we were serving and wanted to you know, continue to serve and how it changed. So um, we uh, have a, uh, you know, a, an application. We do a renewal for returning members. Um, we have, and you know, an application for new members. We have, you know, different ways that you can join the garden. You can be a bed holder. You can just come and work on uh, communal beds. Um, you can be a volunteer. You can be a supporter and just uh, lend expertise. And you know, it's it's an evolving process. You know, we 
you know, think about what works and what doesn't work. But I think that the emphasis really is on attracting a diverse group of people um, with the priority in the South Bronx. You know, we've kind of like had to like sort of really narrow a little bit the, um, you know, the way that um, we can present space and opportunity to prioritize our community. You know, we were created because, you know, there was a need for an urban farm, for a garden, for um, that sort of uh, political and health giving and growing space and learning space. So uh, right now we, you know, have an application process. We have also added a uh, an orientation session for new members. Why? Because you know, the idea of farming and, you know, there's a latitude there, right? You can contribute um, in terms of research, in terms of helping to organize um, from your office or from your computer scheme. But we're asked people to evaluate, honestly, can you dedicate eight hours a month, you know, to physically be at the farm, you know, with a space that large, with as many um, challenges and um, joys as there are, you know, with membership at La Finca, that connection is like vitally important. You know, it, it is critical, you know, to um, tend to the land and to, um, you know, to be able to sustain and be able to work, you know, in coalition. Coalition is really our central, um, our central uh, guiding principle. So, uh, yeah, so, you know, we have sort of, you know, fashioned that, you know, as, as we've evolved, especially over the last seven or eight years. Um, I don't think it's a daunting thing. I think that people who really want to be at the farm, um, you know, are, are anxious, you know, to help in any way. And being at the farm is definitely the ultimate experience. We need to tend crops. We need, you know, to get food out into the community. So, yeah, that's, that's really how we establish our protocols, a little on our own through experience and also with the support and help of our, you know, partner organizations like green thumb okay great mm -hmm. and aura what about your garden how did y'all come up with those membership protocols you have in place right now so um as i stated earlier my the members were already in place but they were older and what i realized is that they didn't have a protocol if you walk by and you said hey i want to plant some seeds you know they let you come in um, so when I got there, I kind of switched up a lot of things. Um, we need a protocol. Um, I let them do it for that season. And then I said, hey, what happened? Y'all all go on vacation. <laughs> I said, <laughs> everyone, everyone here is retired and y'all all go on vacation. What happened? Mm -hmm. This stuff died. And it leaves me to clean up the mess. And they said, oh, don't worry about it. Uh, Green Thumb will come do it. I said, oh, no, 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 no. So I said, we have to create um, a member's application because we need new blood. We need ones that are active. Um, so we started with that. Um, we created an application. But we didn't have no requirements. It was just a general application. Then I noticed that people will fill out the application plant their stuff and they still didn't come back. So now you have to do volunteer work before you even get an application. Um, that's very important. You, but not just at success, but success um, has 57 gardens in Eastern York. You have to go to our friends too to help them out. Um, and it will tell me if you're serious about this because this is this is something that you want to do to do with us and in order to do that you have to create something so that way you know that you know you let the people know that that you're serious about it um and we're not perfect so every year we get better we don't have our, even though Success Gardens is the largest garden in, in East New York, we don't have a lot of members. We have a good eight, uh, eight members. Um, we kept that number for a long time. It's diverse, 
So our members are mixed. Um, but some people say, hey, they want to become members. And when it's time to shovel or <laughs> grab some garbage bags, you, we can't do that. We do um, try our best to make sure that, you know, some people just want to come in for the season. So we utilize them as volunteers. You cannot become a, a member, but you can be a volunteer. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and it's good to have different, you know, some people have different levels of how they can engage with a garden. Um, kind of also speaking to what Nancy was saying, like different, you know, amounts of time they can contribute. So, you know, a volunteer versus a member, it's a good distinction to make in the garden. And so Shauna, can you answer that question too? Um, so I'm still revamping the process. Um, for a long time, uh, Dutton was part of the civic association. And so everyone in the civic was a part of the garden. And essentially, if they wanted for one year, wanted to come in and plant and do whatever they could, if they chose next year not to, that was fine. Um, it, there really wasn't any uh, set protocol as to this is where you're gonna go. On top of that, um, the community, at the, the, excuse me, the Civic at the time had taken over two other plots. So there's two other gardens um, under the one Civic. So a lot of our members floated between the three gardens for a long time. Um, now the Civic Association is disbanded um, and you know the other two gardens, I wasn't, I was still trying to concentrate on making sure Dutton stayed up and running. It was a lot. I know that uh, one of the other gardens is up and running as a different garden now, um, and I'm not sure about the other one, but there, I'm still putting the protocols together because that becomes a big issue where people want to come in, they want to be a part, maybe they fill out an application, um, we see them for probably like two weeks, and then that's it. You don't hear no more from them. And um, you have a whole bed full of vegetables or whatever it was that they planted that you, you're you now responsible for. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still sure. working on those protocols. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And that it's an evolving process because the needs of the garden, the needs of the community change. And you want to make sure to balance like people being in that space, but also that there is a responsibility. Like you said, you don't want, um, you know, a bunch of plants that are being cared for. Um, so yeah, thanks for those answers. So the next question uh, I have is, uh, you know, uh, and we get this a lot, uh, what kind of skills do you need in your gardens that aren't necessarily gardening based? You know, if someone, you know, doesn't have a green thumb, how can they contribute to the garden? Um, yeah, and we, you know, have a lot of people who want to join and don't necessarily have those gardening skills. So, you know, what can they contribute to your gardens? Uh, we'll start with you, Nancy. Um, okay, so there are so many ways to be part of La Finca. Again, you know, we emphasize that our space is really large, that, you know, our priority is, you know, taking care of plants and, and people and, the, you know, because this is all for the community. Um, but we also recognize that many people ha may have, like, hesitation about, you um, you know, joining a garden because they feel that they don't have a green thumb or, you know, a background in it. Um, you know, my um, motivation to garden was mostly an ancestral thing, being, you know, raised um, in uh, New York, you know, Puerto, Puerto Rican heritage, but I was an artist, I was a teacher, and we found that by, you know, that all these skills can be utilized in the garden. So, um, on our application, we have like a whole checklist of um, skills that you either have or are interested in learning. And I find that that really like helps people feel relaxed about joining the garden. Um, we have a lot of um, learning one-on-one. -on -one. We have, you know, our one, our one <laughs> paid person at La Finca that we always try to find funding for is a farm manager. So um, those people tend to be people that, you know, have had farming experience or, are, you know, uh, in different um, programs where, you know, they, they are really learning how to share those skills. But we also teach each other. It's like, you know, just having beds together. We know weeds communicate. We encourage each other to, um, 
you know, grow and maintain and, and you know, remediate in certain ways. So um, it's just that diversity. So, you know, we've had, we have beekeepers, we have cooks, we have uh, artists, you know, we've done healing, activism, performance, internships, um, partnerships with all sorts of organizations. So, you know, I think diversity is a key to um, making people feel comfortable and just doing it. You know, you have to do it. You know, really, that's the best way to learn gardening, um, you know, to be able to enjoy the, the way that those, you know, plants and foods and fruits and vegetables taste, um, to be able to discuss and discover that with each other. So that community, that learning from each other, you know, cultures, skills, um, languages, I mean, and I think that that's really what, what keeps people rooted to the garden once once they decide to become part of our group and our community. All right, thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, Aura? Mm -hmm. So um, what my experience is, like I, I'm gonna recap what I stated, I wasn't a gardener. <laughs> I had no idea. I knew how to grow because of my grandparents. But in Brooklyn, East New York, you didn't think that you was going to be able to grow so many things. Um, so when my members, when potential members come and they say, hey, well, I don't have a green thumb. You know, I can just paint some benches or help with events. Eventually, they end up in the back. They end up back there learning how to plant a seed. So they don't stay in that category so long, they become gardeners. And then they ask, how do you teach? We are a teaching garden. So even though you might, that might not be your thing, we have to show you. Um, so we show you how to plant. We show you how to um, pick up the crops and, and things like that. And then we have to look for more event people and people to help put uh, programs together because they convert over to gardeners. Um, and that's it. We just, we open the door for everyone. We just ask everyone to come with good spirit. That's all you need. Um, we don't like bad energy. We're not a person, we, we're not going through that. Um, just come with good spirits and let um, your, your flow through, your figure out your way on what works for you in success? Because success might not be the place for you. You know, so you'll figure out what works for you. And if it doesn't, we understand. Okay, thank you. And um, lastly, Shauna. Um, so it's basically been said already, but it's it's the truth. Um, when you're when you have a new gardener coming in, I didn't know how to garden much. I did know what I was taught at home from my parents or from my grandparents. But other than that, I didn't know much about growing. Everyone in the garden, um, a lot of our members are not, they don't even have a plot, um, but they do do the garden events. They do um, outreach for us, they, you know, they, provide some type of uh, skill set. Um, and even on our, our application, we ask that, even if it's not gardening, what kind of skill can you bring to the garden organization um, so that we can best utilize you? Because we are we pretty much open to the public. We allow anybody to come in when we're open, even if all they want to do is just sit and enjoy the you know, the environment that they're in. Um, so it's, it all depends on the person coming in and what they're willing to do. If they, if they want to get their hands dirty and play with some worms, then we can do that. If not, um, maybe you can be a junior teacher or something, uh, take some workshop classes for us and bring the information back. There's always ways to uh, help a garden. Okay, thanks. And so, you know, what I'm hearing from all three of you is just that it's most important to be willing to be in community, to come to the garden, you know, not just to do something for yourself, 
um, or have like a laser focus, you know, on what you want to accomplish there, but to be willing to learn, to be willing to admit what you don't know, what you do know, and just to be open to trying different roles in the garden. And, you know, if you're willing to learn, then people will teach you those skills. Um, you know, and just to note, as an outreach coordinator, for me, I think some skills um, that are important, for instance, if I'm trying to get in touch with someone, people who are good at, you know, being in contact, filling out permits, you know, not all of it is just vegetable growing or, you know, to have those vegetables or put on those events. Sometimes you got to fill out forms and that sort of thing. So, you know, definitely if you have administrative skills, those are uh, needed. I'm hearing a lot of teaching skills because, uh, the gardens have, a lot of gardens have a teaching element, just even if you're a good teacher. Um, and also, um, yeah, so thanks for uh, giving those answers. And the last thing I wanted to ask is, what are the benefits of joining a community garden? You know, we're talking about how to join a garden, but why should people join gardens? Nancy? Oh, <laughs> okay. I'm checking my, my mic here. The benefits are that, you know, you really are part of something, you know, that is so essential, something that really keeps, in my opinion, keeps us um, human. Um, being an artist and an educator, you know, before I identified myself as a gardener, um, you know, it it's vital, especially now, to keep um, this, you know, touch with your, you know, your own humanity and with other people you know, people, um, you know, to learn things that are so elemental and essential that are in, you know, it's basically in all our, our DNA. Um, you know, during the height of COVID, um, you know, our most local community members were vital in continuing our growing, our community feeding, food relief efforts. And, um, you know, we, 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 you know, saw how important it was especially for people that, you know, may live in intergenerational households that had to continue working to have this open, um, welcoming and safe space, you know, when, um, you know, other people could come from a little further. Um, it was just, it, it was like invaluable, you know, to have this farm, to be part of this, this um, whole beautiful um, effort. So I think, especially now in the times that we're living where we're, we are more isolated than we have been in anybody's living memory, I think. I think that that's the important, you know, to be part of a community, to know that, you know, you are changing and evolving and doing good. You know, many people ask, how can I make a difference? How can I, you know, um, serve? How can I be kind? There are all these like catchwords and phrases and it's really about action. It's really about just, you know, taking that step every day. You know, just getting getting to the farm is not easy every day. I take care of a, a toddler. I take care of an elder who's in need of, you know, my help. But the farm is really like my, my therapy. The farm is my safe space. And um, it's my connection to my, my ancestors. It's, you know, so there are so many ways that you can connect to the meaning and the importance of that farm. And, you know, to your community, um, and it could be, a, like you, like someone said, a community you have to travel to because that's the space that you want to be in. So I would just say that um, it is, it, it's critical. It's critical to us, you know, um, keeping sanity and keeping connection and keeping, uh, you know, our humanity right now. I don't know, that may be deeper than we were going for, but that's really the way I feel. About I, like it. I really deep. feel blessed. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I like deep. That was a great answer. Great answer. Aura? Okay. Um, the importance of joining a community garden, I would say peace. Um, yes, it's work. Um, yes, it's just not easily ran. And yes, sometimes you have to travel. But when you walk into that space, whether you're helping to clean or anything is peaceful. Your children are safe. Um, it's just something that happens. I don't um, know. I just only speak for success, but some people don't want to come there to clean. Some people don't want to join. They just want to sit there. They want to sit there and really get their thoughts together. It's a thinking space. It's a... Um, but it also allows them in that space 
to look around in their community to realize, you know, this space is needed, you know, and, and be thankful for that space because it's there. Not many people can walk outside of their door and go into a safe space where you see birds and you have fruit trees and, and things like that. So enjoy the space. Whether you want to join, whether you don't want to join, enjoy your community gardens because they are there for y'all. They're there for us. Um, and as long as we keep it up and work together, they will always be there. Thank you, thank you. And Shauna? I agree with both Nancy and Aura. It is, it is the, the serenity of the space. It is the, the network that it brings you. It's the community that you, uh, that is yours and it's there for you to enjoy. Um, I, I've met so many great people there. I've had so, I've enjoyed having functions there. I've enjoyed uh, learning there. Um, it's, it is very much needed. And in, in, in the last two years in trying to hold everything together with this, uh, you know, because uh, um, I didn't mention that before, but we lost two of our founders in 2019. So it was everything around us was, sh was crazy. But when you walked into that garden, everything else, walked, it just left you. Um, so that's, that's a benefit that most people don't enjoy. And I do encourage you, if you find a garden in your community, to just, just walk in there and see what the space feels like. Um, taking that energy, hopefully you walk away with uh, very good energy because those are beautiful places to be. All right, thank you, Shauna. And I'm sorry to hear that you lost some members. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, I think it's really important. The words that stick out are peace, serenity, and community. It's in the you know phrase community garden. And so the benefit is it kind of uh, it reminds me of the video we watched earlier with Miss Butler. And she said the same thing. Um, you know, a lot of times when I'm working with gardens and, you know, sometimes there might be um, some conflict or um, some other challenges that they're facing. And one thing I like to ask is, what is why does everybody want to be in the garden? And what is your goal? You know, why do you want to be involved? And I feel like that is the main through line of everyone's answer, whether they have a children's garden, whether they have a vegetable garden, whether they have a more, you know, arts or cultural garden, is that they just want a place to be in peace, a place to relax and to provide that place for the community. And so, you know, I, I like the encouragement of you all saying to just go to the gardens. Um, you know, we're talking about how to join a garden, but the gardens are just open to the general public too. If for some reason the garden in your neighborhood, you can't become a member or volunteer, you know, I just encourage everybody to just go to the gardens and spend time in there. Uh, especially this year, we're going to have open hours, um, which had been on pause uh, for during the pandemic. Um, so gardens are going to be open this season. So, you know, again, if membership doesn't work out for some reason or another, just visit a garden, spend time in the space. You can still get those benefits. Okay, so that was our last question for the panel. Um, so now we're going to take questions from the audience uh, during our Q&A, and I see people have been putting a lot of good questions. Um, so we've been, we've been seeing the questions, everybody, so thank you for putting them. And so yeah, we'll go with our first question. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Ellie. I'm the Community Engagement Associate here at Green Them. Um, I've been pulling all of the awesome questions you've been throwing into the chat. Um, and keeping them <laughs> um, so that I can ask um, our outreach coordinator, Aaron, and also our three awesome panelists. Um, so one attendee um, has been hearing through the rumor mill that there might be um, a new Green Thumb garden in the works. Um, and so they're wondering, um, how they can find more information about developing Green Thumb Gardens. Um, Aaron, I think this might be more in your wheelhouse. Um, um, I guess the nature of the question is how to find out more about um, gardens in the area um, that might not necessarily be online yet. Okay, 
So thanks for that question. Um, and yeah, so as an outreach coordinator, if you go on the Green Thumb website and you uh, look up gardens in your area, um, you'll find that uh, each garden is a, an outreach coordinator and each uh, uh, borough and community board basically are out associated with outreach coordinators. And so you can reach out to that outreach coordinator, our emails are there. Um, and find out if there are, you can ask if there's, uh, you know, a lot of people just say something like, hey, I'm moving to Astoria, you know, do you know any gardens in the area that I can join? Um, or if you know of a lot that you've seen, if, you know, the rumor mills about like, oh, this lot down the block might be turned into a garden, then you can reach out to the outreach coordinator that covers that area and learn if there's anything happening in that garden or if you can get something started. So yeah, I just recommend going on the Green Thumb website and finding out which outreach coordinator is assigned to the area you're interested in, rather finding out about joining a garden um, or getting started or getting a garden started. Great, that um, leads conveniently into um, another question someone had um, in terms of starting a community garden. Um, I don't think any of our panelists started a community garden, you joined um, gardens that had already been established, right? No, actually, I I was one of the co-founders of La Finca del Sur, so I helped to start that garden. Yeah, it, it was very much a collective um, effort. I would recommend to anybody who is thinking of, or interested in starting a garden to you know, make sure that you have a coalition of people. You know, this, you know, community gardening is about community. It's about, you know, being um, in coalition with other people because it's a tremendous amount of work. Um, as Aaron uh, stated, and some of the other panelists, you know, there are people who um, deal with the paperwork. There's a lot of paperwork. You have to go through city agencies. You have to go through whatever the ownership and provenance of that space is. You have, you know, it's about ordering supplies. It's about, you know, making those connections so that you can actually get this off the ground once you have permission to use that um, space. It's about finding out what the community wants. You know, it, I'm moving to Astoria, but I've got to know what my neighbors who, you know, have been living in Astoria, what they, you know, would like, you know, how can I join them? You know, it's, uh, this is a problem that we're having in a lot of spaces where people have founded gardens and, you know, there's change, you know, New York is changing so rapidly right now. And there are people with different, you know, interests and view. And I think most people um, have good intention, but you've got to respect, you know, the community that's there. You've got to respect what the needs are there, you know, otherwise, you know, for lack of a better word, you're seen as, you know, a gentrifier, as a person who's coming to impose some sort of a vision, even if you're not, you know what I mean? But that's the point of being in community with the community where you want to start a garden. All right, thanks, Nancy. That was a great answer. And again, you know, I know we keep saying this again and again, community garden, the word community, but it's a really important aspect. You know, it's not like, um, might be dating myself, but it's not like Field of Dreams, that movie where a man's like, if I just build this whole thing on my own, they'll come. No, you need the people there from the start, okay? Like if you have this beautiful garden, but nobody there to garden with you or no one in your community interested in growing vegetables, they're like, no, I'd rather have like a, you know, a botanical garden with a stage, then you're not gonna have the support you need. Um, I'd say even a good thing is just to reach out to the gardens that are already in the area. See if there's something that you can contribute there first. Or um, also if you can just get support from them, learn from them, you know, there's a lot of institutional knowledge in these gardens. Um, you know, some of these gardens have been around, like we said, since the seventies. And so it is really important to make sure that you are engaging your neighbors and the other people in your community and you understand what the community wants because you don't wanna go full steam building this garden on your own and then you open the doors and no one comes and you have no help. So yeah. Again, community, that's the, that's the word we wanna drive home today is community and community gardens. Nancy, you're still muted. No, if I could just say that, you know, also there's an, you know, there is a, a coalition with agencies such as Green Thumb. I think outreach coordinators can't be overemphasized 
as people who really, really can, you know, um, help, especially in navigating, you know, a new space or even a very experienced space, um, you know, that, uh, you know, community gardens, especially if, and you need, you need some of these agencies on, you know, on your side and, and in support unless you're like on privately owned land where you have some sort of an arrangement with someone, you know? So um, no one is really independent. Um, you know, we, we really work in coalition, so. And um, for our next question, someone's wondering about um, the specifics of, um, membership costs and what um yeah they're asking about the nature of membership at community gardens um they're wanting to know if it depends on the garden um and um to answer that question um shauna do you want to start by talking about your garden membership details sure um we do have a membership fee um and that is a yearly fee uh the biggest difference I'll say um, between that being a member and a volunteer is once you pay that fee, you do get a copy of keys, which means you have access to the garden anytime that you want to come in and do whatever it is that you're going to do. Um, most of our volunteers, though, have to, you know, pretty much come in on a schedule. Um, we have our regular Saturday hours, but between our regular members, the, the hours during the week may differ. And so they would have to communicate with us on a volunteer basis. But if you're a member, you, there is a membership fee. It's $36 for a year. Um, and that'll give you a set of keys and your own plot. Thanks for sharing. Um, Aura, what about you? So we do have a uh, membership dues. Um, it varies, depends on that individual. Um, you have some that can pay the full, you have some, again, we service all different levels of people. So I do individual, I sit down with them. Okay, what can you afford? How can you help? Um, some people don't have it. Some people don't have it. So, you know, I deal with the situation at hand and then we, we figure it out. You know, we, we work around it. Um, not everyone is success pay dues. I do have my core people that I know that pay dues, but not everyone pays dues. So that's the benefit. Some people can, some people can't. The ones that, you know, are in hours, um, um, be at an event when I can't be there or any of the members can't be there. So they make it up in the ways. But you don't know way you don't have to. Or I'm having a hard time um, hearing you. I think you're having some connectivity glitch. Um, I think- Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Will you just go back a couple, <laughs> a couple sentences? Okay, so what I was saying is that um, we do have due money. Um, we do request membership fees, but not everyone pays the same amount of fees. It depends on the person and the different levels. Because we have some retires, some um, retirees, we have working people, we have students. It, it's just a different level. So, and some people don't pay at all. It depends. You know, they can make it up in our opening hours or helping up with, with other things. Um, so just because they can't pay the fee doesn't mean they can't be a member, a value member. That's what I was saying. Great, thank you so much for sharing. Um, Nancy, is it similar um, over at your garden? 
Uh, yes, I was shaking my head a lot at Aura's um, comments because it, it really is the same at La Finca. We have a basic membership fee of around $40 for the season, but that is like the top, you know, um, the top, you know, fee or donation um, that we have. If you share a bed, it's, it's half of that. We have a, a rate for seniors, a rate for students. Um, some people barter, you know, their membership. Um, so yeah, there are all different ways, you know, we, you know, we really want, um, everyone to be able to, to do this, um, you know, and it's, you know, it, it's a difficult thing. I mean, economics are a difficult thing. You know, we charge a membership fee. Why? Because, you know, gardens need, you know, things to run. Um, you know, if you're having, um, you know, you're planting, you know, you may not have seed, you may not have, you know, may need to buy lumber, even though Green Thumb and other, um, you know, urban ag organizations do a lot to support. Um, that gives us a, you know, it gives us a, a foundation. We know that, you know, for the essential, you know, uh, things for this farm, we will have, you know, um, some funds and, you know, um, that's that's the reason for a membership fee. Um, during COVID, for the past two seasons, actually, we didn't charge a fee because we knew people were going through, you know, hard times and, you know, we just made it work. We got a few donations that covered that. So this year we're going back into membership fees. Um, but again, it's just as Aura said, it's about welcoming people and not making that restrictive of your participation. Thanks, Nancy. And I just like to add, just in terms of Green Thumb, you know, we do allow gardens to make their um, own membership fees, uh, but we strongly encourage gardens to have a path to membership that, you know, uh, is not um, based on uh, a membership fee if people can't um, afford to pay right. a fee. Yeah. So we str yeah. strongly encourage gardens to allow people to still participate, even if they can't pay the fee. Exactly. Can I add something, Joe? Um, I will say this. When Green Dome, during COVID, we couldn't get anything, nothing. And that's when those fees actually came into place. We were able to buy soy, we were able to buy lumber. So yeah, you might can't, and we understand that, but we encourage you to because anything can happen. Was no coming out. The, that was, the world was on board. So we actually um, had to use our fees. We had to use our money to make sure that we can still grow. Right. And that's the important part is about helping. Everything is mm -hmm. never going to be for free. You know, right. it's about building the community and giving right. back to your community, to our community. And making sure that we, if something happens, we can take care of ourselves. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, so mm -hmm. I just had to share that because. Right. <laughs> yeah. And Aura, if I may, I just want to say I agree with you. And that's why La Finca has had fees in place. The South Bronx has typically been looked at as a place where everything had to be given to people. And in establishing this um, farm, you know, we wanted to say, you know what, we can do this together and we can do this for ourselves. And um, like I said, you know, during COVID, we just happened to be, you know, have a reserve of supplies. Um, people brought things, people like, you know, we have a huge Mexican community and those folks all brought seeds. They brought like, you know, seedlings. They had started at, you know, their homes, um, you know, Green Thumb, you know, was able to help us in some way, um, we formed a Bronx coalition called the uh, Bronx Farm Hubs with the help of the um, NYBG and Bronx Green Up. And that really helped us because we were able to address the food insecurity in the South Bronx. But one thing that I've always emphasized to people from my community is that, you know, we have a market, a farm stand or something like that. You may not be able to give me $2 for this, two or $3 for this bunch of collards, but give me what you can. You know what I mean? Give us what you can because you are supporting, 
you know, this, this self-determination, right? This political um, response that we are doing and this human response that we're doing. So yeah, and, and I think people really feel good being able to be part of that, so. Yeah, with the fees that we collected during COVID, every Wednesday we fed 500 families, you know, mm -hmm. during mm -hmm. our school pantry. That is a big deal. Mm -hmm. And Amazing. even if you gave a dollar or two dollars and went to feeding 500 families and people That's say, right. well, we're getting the food for free. No, the members are paying for this truck to be delivered. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's a lot. And sometimes it falls on the primary, a lot of the responsibility. So, you know, we just encourage people not to just join, but join for real and understand yeah. that it is a responsibility mm -hmm. and know mm -hmm. the responsibility. Don't just want to come and take pictures, <laughs> but enjoy <laughs> the experience so you can yeah. have the peace and you can have the positive energy because that's mm -hmm. important. Yeah. And, and to be quite honest, um, Aura, when people pay a fee, they tend to come, you know, because they put their money down already, right? You know, so it is that a commitment. Part, Nancy. Like, yeah. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. They've invested. So, yes, they yep. show up. Even yep. those in our garden that don't plant anything, they show up to every meeting, they show up to every event, they help out, they, you know, and they, they're appreciative of being part of uh, the, the, the garden, even if they're not actually planting anything. Mm -hmm. All of this um, mention of um, COVID is a great lead into one of our next questions. Um, someone's wondering, um, are gardens in general open to the public outside of um, special events? And I know um, there's um, COVID <laughs> change Green Thumbs policy about open hours and now we're kind of um, for the upcoming garden season the open hours requirement um, is looking a little different. Erin um, do you want to speak to that and then maybe we can ask our panelists what kind of open hours they work to um, maintain at their garden spaces? Mm, yeah and so you know though we're talking about membership gardens are open to the general public. And that was a little on pause slash up to kind of the garden itself during COVID. And so in this uh, coming season, starting April 1st until October 31st, gardens will have to maintain open hours. And the way that works is that gardens have to have 20 hours open to the general public. So that means that, you know, their gates open and they're welcoming people in from the community, even if you're not a volunteer or a member. Um, so gardens will be open to the public uh, this coming season. And um, a half of those hours, 10 of those hours will be posted. So I say it is 20 hour requirement. Um, 10 of those hours should be posted somewhere either on our website um, or on the garden itself. We're in the process of getting open hours, helping our gardens to establish open hours, just so you can know, know what you know the outreach coordinators are doing right now. Um, so, we're helping the gardens to establish the open hours and then we're going to have them posted on our website and at the garden itself so people can know. So there will be 10 of those hours that you'll know for sure that the garden's gonna be open, um, five of those hours on weekends, and then there'll be the other 10 hours where the gardeners can open it at their discretion. And uh, so, um, and like Elliot was asking to our panelists, uh, you know, um, have you, uh, how are you gonna have your garden open have you uh, established the open hours for the new season and kind of like how does that work and then we'll start with um we'll start with shauna okay um so for this year um because we'll be going back to open hours and my shortness of membership um it's weird. we have to really figure out how we're going to maintain the 20 hours um i know we could handle 10 at, at the very least Saturdays where somebody's always in a garden on Saturday. Um, but it's, it's important, um, which I learned over uh, COVID because I was in the garden a lot more because it was one, it needed to be uh, maintained during COVID and two, um, it became a, 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 a a safe space for me, um, uh, especially kicking off everything that had just happened. 
Um, and so I realized I have two of the sweetest elderly people across the street who love to just come in and sit either under our gazebo or we have these two um, picnic benches and they don't want a garden. They just want to change their surrounding for a good 20 minutes. And they would, every time I would open up the gate and I'd be there and it didn't matter if it was seven o'clock in the morning or three in the afternoon, they would just walk right on in and they would come and they would sit down and just take whatever time they needed. So it's having the garden open and it available to um, certain residents because maybe their closest park is not in walking distance for them, but the community space, the garden space is. Um, and for them, we're right across the street as opposed to having to walk around two big blocks to get to the nearest park. Um, and so having that space open for them is very important. So we're gonna try to figure out something um, for the coming season. Um, I, I just really, you know, if we had more people to spread around the schedule, I think it would be a lot easier for us, but we're going to figure it out. All right. Thank you. And, you know, um, talking about ways that people can get involved in a garden, even if you aren't uh, necessarily a gardener, just being available for the open hours. That's a huge help, um, especially on the weekdays. We know that that can be hard. You know, this is a volunteer at the end of the day, a volunteer um, endeavor. So, you know, if people are thinking of ways like, oh, I don't know how to grow things or necessarily run an event or something like that, or on like paperwork, if you're just there in the garden, um, opening up to the public. That's a huge service to the gardens. Um, okay. So Aura, what about your garden? Um, you know, how are you, um, tackling open hours this year? Um, so we are going to have open hours. We just haven't picked the date yet, the day. Um, that I don't to be open, but I will send it over to Bill as soon as we have our meeting um, next week with the members of the availability. Um, I see somebody, I just read a chat and I saw somebody talk about dogs. Um, so no dogs allowed in success. I just want to let everyone know that. Um, <laughs> um, we, but, you know, we open it up and it's up to people resources to come in. Um, when we tried to open up before pre-COVID, um, people would say, well, it wasn't open. I'd be like, well, we opened up at eight o'clock and we closed at 11. And they was like, well, we don't come outside to 12. So really trying to get the community um, to see when would they like it open, the, you know, suggestions and things like that and hoping that members can fill in those slots because that's important also. When would do your garden, your community garden is available to your community and um, how can it serve the community? You know, I mean, it's not our fault that someone gets up at 12, but hey, if they say in 12, then maybe we can have someone get there at 12. And like that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. No, that's a, that's a great point is, uh, you know, um, that you have to balance like what members can just realistically can do to like how people, you know, how they want to um, use a gardener. Like you said, like who wants to sleep in? <laughs> um, you know, there always is a balance there. Uh, and Nancy? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> One moment. Uh, just looking to see. I'm, am I on mic? I always forget to turn on the mic. Um, yeah, so that I just want to say that that really underscores the the importance of people being involved in whatever way as volunteers, as community members, as um, you know members, um, if you can, because you know that does provide that coverage. Um, we uh, generally kick off our season with uh, an event called Waking Up the Farm. That usually happens like the second week of March. We're still thinking about this and with uh, monthly meetings so that, you know, then we can create a schedule to see um, initially how we are going to um, open up, you know, for uh, our public hours. We 
are pretty successful, like on weekends. And then we have members who work, who come, let's say early evening hours. We usually are able to put together those um, 20 hours. So our hope is um, during our initial meetings, we will actually create that schedule. And um, like Aura and Shauna were saying, you know, uh, neighborhood people, neighborhood people who, um, you know, can come in and, and sort of, uh, you know, help with that. Also, our, our um, Green Thumb Outreach Coordinator last year put together some, uh, some internships, and it was a beautiful experience with the Department of Probation. And, you know, so when we had, you know, my husband and I um, are co-founders and garden stewards, so we were there for most of them. But if we couldn't make it, you know, he was there and leading the group. And this, um, you know, created a little more space. So it's really about careful planning. Um, I think having a schedule and asking members to really commit, you know, think realistically about what times you can be there and, um, you know, creating that framework. It just gives everybody peace of mind, but I hear, I totally hear that about having, you know, a short list of members. Um, then you've got to get creative, um, you know, so, you know, for us, we're, we're just being hopeful that we can get the, uh, the coalition of our members and potential members and volunteers. Um, one last thing I'd like to say is for La Finca, it's a really critical thing because we're not in a neighborhood per se. We've had an ongoing problem with break-ins, like 20 of them since um, 2019, since September. And it's just because, you know, we are between the uh, Metro North track, the um, Major Deegan Expressway. Um, it's very isolated at night. And, um, you know, so it's, it's, there's also security things. You know, you want to make sure that anybody who is in the garden, you know, t really is not there alone in case something, you know, does happen. You know, if, if an accident happens on two, two and a half acres, you know, if you should become injured or something like that, it's really important to make sure that there is somebody there, you know, at least someone to pair up. So um, we've kind of got this down to, you know, sort of a drill now, and we're hoping that we can successfully put it together um, for this season again. Yeah, absolutely right, Nancy. Um, when when the community come in, you know, we're, we're a large garden too, where are they allowed to go? Where aren't they allowed to go? We had a terrible break in too. And, um, you know, they stole all of our equipment. So it's like, now it's like, and we're speaking, yes, we on the panel, but we're all gardeners, right? And everyone in here has experienced that. So, we ask the same questions that um, the people that is inside of this um, conference is asking. What do we do and how do we do it when you're experiencing things like this? Mm. Yeah, I, right now, I know that uh, we're- Nancy, in, I hate to yes. interrupt, but um, we're coming okay. to the end of our time. Um, yeah. You know, you're, you all are definitely talking about important things like safety and security in the garden. Um, but I just wanna make sure we have enough time to prep for our next, uh, um, workshop. Um, so uh, thank you for all the questions, everyone. I know we didn't get to all of people's questions. Um, so please, I ask you to um, join the Slack. We're going to hop into the Slack after this. Um, me and some other outreach coordinators will be there to help give you some information. And um, yeah, and so for everyone else, uh, thank you for attending. And um, let's see. Yeah, that's it. And thank you to our panelists for uh, being here today. I really appreciate it. And uh, good luck with the gardening season. And like I said before, I hope folks join gardens, you know, uh, reach out to the outreach coordinators, reach out to gardens and find out about membership uh, or volunteering if you don't have the time for membership or just go to your garden and spend time in there. You can just do that. <laughs> mm -hmm.